All right. Well, welcome to our Friday seminar, 6 p.m. This is uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. This is going to be um, with Chris Casillas, who is the uh, executive director and founder of Regenerating Sonora. Uh, it's a nonprofit that's based in Superior, Arizona, and its focus is on nurturing local potential for a resilient and regenerative future. Chris also helps build leaderful organizations as the co-founder of the uh, Development Dojo, which focuses on um, leadership skills and a, quite a lot of psychological flexibility as well. He's also the board member at the Center for Shamanic Education and Exchange, and he has a background in tech where he played a key role in helping to scale a business from startup to becoming a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. Um, I know Chris from the Design School for Regenerating the Earth. He's very active there in his work in his community of, um, of Superior, Arizona, but also within the larger Copper Corridor, which is a region within Arizona. He's working to weave relationships between a number of communities and organizations. And he just overall has a great perspective on how to use pro-social in the real world. I feel like he's uh, got a great example of um, getting away from just the theory of pro-social and trying to implement it in a really flexible and natural way. So I'm really excited for Chris to be here, to be able to um, to share some of the stuff that he has been working on. Um, yeah, and Chris, I, I did give you um, host privileges as well. So if you want to share your screen at all, feel free and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. And I'm very happy to be here. ProSocial has a good reputation. And even with uh, people who don't know anything about it, when I talk about uh, it being the science of cooperation and taking uh, evolutionary concepts and applying them to groups, it's like people just kind of get it really quickly, which is nice. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I was presenting at the, the Forum for Democracy earlier this week and someone from one of the co-founders of that group said hey you're going to be over at the pro-social thing on friday nice so it's being really interesting these uh small corners of the internet uh you start seeing some of the same faces or hearing similar names so um i i count it all as in being in good company so thanks for uh having me be here i'm going to share my screen and this will just take a second to get going properly but we'll get there so thanks for your patience. Um, so you see my screen? Okay. Yes. So they say, they, the big they say, it's important to start with why. So I'll start with uh, the, the personal why for me. So um, this picture uh, says it all really. Here's me uh, being initiated as a community helper by my Nana and my Tata. Um, so, you know, part of living in Superior, where I'm from, which is a population 3,000. Um, this is a small rural town about an hour east of Phoenix. Um, we have a, a half the household uh, average income as the rest of the state of Arizona with 1.5 times the poverty. So uh, we're HUD economic uh, op opportunity zone. Um, there was this, this, the Biden administration recently just uh, announced this, um, like, climate core uh, initiative. And a part of it was like focusing on um, people who are um, affected by climate change through that they have some analysis of like um, the, those that are qualified communities that uh, are, are going to suffer or are suffering from uh, the climate impacts. And so we're definitely on there. So the needs high, especially here um, in 1993, um, the the big copper mine that was here had just shut down and uh, well I guess in 1982 and so uh, about 80% of the working male population all work for the mine and uh, so just the boom and bust process copper price goes down and uh, next thing you know the the town's boarded up we went from a population of 8,000 to around 3,000 so this idea of the of our elders coming together organizing themselves to provide food for their community um, there's a real reason for it and um, when be, being a young person, you just think like, oh, this is what we do in Superior. Like I, I live here, this is my town and, um, and what we do is, is help each other. And so seeing those examples, it, you know, get, got in my bones really. 
And uh, even though I did leave Superior, um, it, like to get, go and find a career, um, those those opportunities to help your neighbors, they just, for me, they stuck with me. So um, then, you know, fast forward, I get into tech and uh, started a small company, helped them grow to being uh, a, a successful organization. And by the end of it, I'm leading multiple people and uh, they've all had uh, careers that have gone on to surpass uh, mine. Uh, I left because I just like was seeing all these issues um, with that we're facing. Like maybe you've heard, uh, is it the meta crisis? Is it the poly? The fact that we're even having the conversation of like, what do we call this? And is it even, is it a crisis? Or, like we all kind of get that uh, the situation is uh, is dire. Um, I, I've heard. Um, one friend say that uh, we're trying to escape an escalating tragedy. And uh, with the ecological destruction, the societal dysfunction at play, um, there's a lot of issues that we're facing. And, you know, I had the the advantage of having all the other Maslow's needs uh, checked off, except for the self-actualization one. And, uh, and this really like called to me because I'm thinking to myself, well, I want to have kids one day and what kind of world am I bringing them into, do, do I really just want to sit back and pass the buck on to future generations without playing some kind of role to do something about it? So I quit my job and just like went off asking a bunch of questions for um, about a year uh, before um, having any conclusions about what I might do. And so I'll skip what, what that, that was a, a good side story there, but we'll skip that for now. just to say that, um, my my son Francisco he turns three months today, so he's the sixth generation community member of Superior. So, um, like I'm just so proud of my my little son. He's just like he started. I gotta stop myself. I'm gonna start talking. I was just, this whole presentation, I'd be like, and then my son he started making these noises. So let me reel it back here. Sorry. Um, so I can look at him in the eyes and say, hey, I'm doing something. I'm pl I'm playing. I'm doing the best I can with what I know and what I can do. And, uh, and that was to found this nonprofit, which turns four years old tomorrow. We're going to have a party. Um, so Regenerating Sonora, yeah, we're a nonprofit focused on uh, regenerative neighborhood development. And um, you might ask, like, what does that word regenerative mean? Okay, you're, you're doing some work, but what does that word regenerative mean? The way I explain it to some people is, like, if I'm talking to, like, a five or six-year-old, then I'll say, like, oh, sustainability is trying to be less bad. And trying to be regenerative is to be a net positive. That's like one, like if you're like trying to simplify it, that's how you might explain it. Um, but if we're thinking about uh, this in, especially with a group like this, we can talk about it in a different way. So if we're focused on uh, doing regenerative work, um, for us, it's place-based. So we're talking about the place that we're calling superior. Um, we see this this is, you could say it's a, an evolutionary unit if you want. Um, it, it certainly is, in, in, from our perspective, like a living being. The, there's, a, there's a spirit and an essence to this place that we call superior. And uh, you, can really, you can really tell when you're driving to or away from superior, you can feel um, a kind of shift in your body that's reported by many people when you like go there or leave there. So... What we're saying is when we're talking about doing regenerative development, we're looking to see the essence of the place, and that's what we're looking to regenerate um, on and on. We do that by looking at transcontextual patterns that uh, have a through line across multiple living systems. An example would be like, we can look at the geology and start to learn about what's happening geologically there. And of course, that affects the hydrology, um, and that affects the flora and fauna. Uh, and then there's all the pre-contact and post-contact history and current events. And we're looking where are the patterns that we can ascertain throughout all this that start to just cut across. Like that, the notion of boom and bust is like an example of a pattern that we hear. Like I, I was so surprised speaking to an archaeologist and I was asking, well, tell me about the history of this place. And one of the first things he said is, oh, it's all boom and bust here. And I was really surprised because we talk about that, you know, in the post-contact history about this boom and bust notion. So here it is showing up in, in like an archaeological context of pre-contact history as an example. So when we think about like variety selection replication, um, just using, using this notion loosely here is that when we're trying to do um, neighborhood work and we're trying to support our community, there's like a big variety of things that we could do and ways that we could go about it. And what we're looking to do 
is we're looking for those patterns and then we're trying to say, okay, let's use the, the patterns that we can understand about the place as a way to attenuate the variety. How can we start to look across all the different things we can do? What things seem to line up with the patterns that we already see that seem to fit here for our context? And this is all, we, we say context is queen in the sense that like you can use context to understand what we might do. So that's just an example of how we can start to use these patterns as a way to select for what we might do. We're not saying we have this great idea from somewhere else and we're going to copy paste it onto our community. You know, we're not trying to to nail and scale it in that sense here. Um, so it is, it is a different way of working. And so we have a number of these patterns that we look at and then implications of what those patterns might be. Um, but we're looking at both how, if, if you if you all are familiar with like a, a Markov blanket, it's 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 similar to that. What we're looking at is like how does the place relate to itself? How does uh, how does the place relate to its neighbors? How do the neighbors relate to the place? And then thinking beyond the borders, how can uh, this place uh, affect the um, like orders of magnitude beyond where it's at, like outside of its local system? So beyond its borders completely. So we're asking those questions, um, and then we're doing something about it. But learning about your place is an ongoing effort. And we talk about cultivating shared identity and the power that comes from that is it's it's not like you learn some stuff about your place and say, okay, now I know how my place works. It really is an ongoing process. And this is something that can be, you can reconcile so many differences. If you're doing single issue based work, instead of doing that, you can say, well, the, the single issue is helping our place as a whole. And then that becomes um, a way that we can all start to, to come together. And everyone has a, a piece of the story that they can contribute. So um, we're taking both a tops down and bottoms up approach to our work. The tops down approach is like, let's look at the patterns. Let's understand um, what would make sense here based on those through lines that we can find. Um, other tops down approaches can be like this, this actual tops down approach that we have with um, looking at these six nested questions. Uh, this is really designed with with Ashby's law in mind of requisite variety. Like what we're doing is we're trying to attenuate the variety through each question. So that way, by the time we get to the what, the what is, uh, so what are we actually going to do? Um, it becomes more clear. And that's that tops down approach. The bottoms up approach is uh, being flexible with what emerges. You know, we start to try something, we go out there and uh, actually do actions in the world. And then the question is like, what's actually showing up for real? Um, and that's that's more of the bottoms up approach, the the emergent approach. So we're doing both of those simultaneously. To give you a timeline, then in 2019 we started our organization, and um, this was just before COVID. So we have everyone getting all less than six feet away from each other, no problem. We had the creator of uh, Repair Cafe, if you're familiar with that that movement, come and along with some sustainability experts from Europe, and we're like, all right, this is awesome. And then. COVID hits when it changes, changes everything. So we went from like, let's be a bioregional learning center to, okay, we need to be helpful for our community and what's needed right now. And what uh, we heard loud and clear was um, because school was shut down, all the meals that the families depended on were gone. So that became the, the focus at that point. So for two years, we turned our community center into a uh, meal distribution center. And so you can see some of us over here posing for a picture, uh, over 10,000 meals delivered. But as we're doing that, this is sort of that bottoms up approach now. It's like we, we, we thought, oh, it'd be great to do community gardens one day. But, you know, that, that's kind of like ethereal. But then this, this bottoms up approach is like, like, we cannot keep doing, like, this can't be our sustainable solution here. Calling someone in Phoenix to come with a big semi truck to unload food um, that we put in freezers that we're borrowing from them. And when you look at the food, it's like microwavable hot dogs and hamburgers, like better than nothing, but long-term, like it's not the sustainable approach. So uh, we were fortunate enough to secure a, uh, a lot that was donated by a community member who had passed away. And uh, that's how we started our community garden. So that, and that has gone on ever since. Um, in 2022, when COVID uh, lifted enough to where it was safe for us to get back together again, we started waking up the community center, and I'll talk more about that. We've expanded our grow space uh, thanks to some folks who have recognized the value that we're bringing to the table, and they are financially supporting us to 
expand our efforts. So we literally expanded our garden site there. And then we've been doing uh, technical assistance to nonprofits and regranting um, for smaller groups that uh, don't always have access to the funds that we've been able to find. And then there's all kinds of interesting fun stuff that's that's happening now around land use and housing, uh, community land trusts, watershed management plans, things like that. Uh, but I that's a lot of what we're doing. But uh, I talked about some of the why, but let's talk about some of the how. And I'm hoping to share some principles and some some practices that we're applying and some mental models that we're using in the field, so you can get a sense of uh, of what's working for us and. Um, and maybe that'll be helpful for you in, in the work that y'all are doing. So one principle here is how we do it is as important as what we do. Uh, another way to say that is if it's not fun, we're effed. And um, I, when people ask like, what's your theory of change? If I'm feeling cheeky, sometimes I'll say to throw better parties. Like in some way, I really do see that like if we want to change the world, we really need to throw some really awesome parties. And you can see like we're doing that here, right? It's like we're doing mill distribution uh, during COVID, but you see you got uh, uh, someone balancing something on their head. You got Raven over here dressing up like she's at a rave. Um, and then we have DJ Soupy Town on the side, which you probably can't see. Uh, we have a DJ there. We're just doing this to make it fun. And of course it does uh, mean that people feel more comfortable accepting the food. They could do it with dignity and we can all just have fun doing it. Okay, another how. This is a bit of an eye chart, but um, I, I like talking about this. Um, if you're familiar with Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework, his multi-ontological framework for seeing how there's different orders of, of systems that we can participate in. There's the chaotic, and then there's this distinction between complex and complicated. An example here is like, uh, the, the chaotic, this is like the, the, the spark that, that you may or may not be expecting. Like when COVID hits, it's like, it's boom, like here it is. Now what are you going to do? The, the move in the chaotic space is, is to just do it. These are where you take just do it actions. You take just do it actions and then you maintain that, that cognitive flexibility to start to understand what starts to emerge when you just make some actions. You don't have a lot of time to do too much planning. And then if, if the chaotic is like the spark, then in the complex, this is like, like nurturing the fire. And, you know, an example would be um, after COVID, what, like when it was lifted enough that we could start doing things again, we decided to do a bunch of movie nights. It's just like once a week, we do a movie night and just, just to do some, it's just do it actions. We do the movie nights, not thinking we're going to do a movie night every week for forever. It's more like we're going to do some movie nights and we're going to see who shows up and what happens and start to nurture those relationships and, and whatever potential is there. And in doing that, um, there's no way that I could have said, oh, well, do a bunch of movie nights. And of course, that's going to mean you're going to have self-organized disco parties. And of course, that's going to mean you're going to have um, uh, open mic nights with seven-year-olds and 77-year-olds. Um, there's no way I could have predicted that uh, we'd form a youth, I always hoped that we'd form a youth tech club, but I couldn't have predicted that uh, we'd form this this group that would be almost the, like the heart and soul of the of the community center now uh, is our is our youth tech club, and then you've got uh, and so that's your complex. This is like you know what's the difference between um, like working on your relationship and working on your car? That's like that's like kind of like the difference between like the complex and the complicated being the car. This is where you have uh, more levels of predictability. This is where you can do your precise plan projects in the complicated phase. This is when it's like, let's really make sure that we've nailed down what our roles are, what the expectations are, and what the goals are. And you can see uh, Lakin leading the tech club through that here. And this was their, like, it was their idea to say, we need to like define our roles. And they're the ones who said, we need to define our goals. You know, if, if when we first started tech club, if I'd have been like, all right, so it's our first day, here's what we're gonna do. Let's define our goals. Let's define our roles. Like it would probably zap the energy out of the room. So if the spark is that chaotic phase, the complex is like nurturing the fire, the complicated is like managing the fire. You know, and, and if you overmanage it, you can snuff the flame out. And so there really is this, um, this kind of just, it's hard to put into words the sort of sense to have about, you know, how much is too much. But at least understanding these key distinctions can be helpful and just bringing more awareness to when we're bringing in complicated stuff and when we're you know needing to not and wait 
we, we can have more conscientiousness about that just by having these distinctions in our mind. I won't belabor this point, but I'll just quickly illustrate now that uh, we can also apply this with like our, that was with the community center, here's with our community garden. And so you can see like see the, uh, the blown out uh, lot that we were able to acquire. Uh, we got uh, William and Abel over there or Abraham over there working on uh, cleaning it up. And there's some police officers who showed up on the first day that we did our garden cleanup. And look how far away of a difference those pictures are from like this complicated phase where now we've got like some graphs where we're tracking people's time and we're starting to be able to say that we can predict the number of hours that we're spending, the number of beds that we're building in a month, the number of gallons of soil that we can harvest. Like we can, we can have, we can have all of it. We can have in the complex our really fun planting parties that that we throw all the time. Uh, we usually do them for the full moon. So next Friday will be our next planting party. Um, and there's room for all that. And if if you're familiar with Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework, um, there's of course the clear. And uh, I, I want to put it to to you all here that. Um, what's clear and what can cut across these various um, aspects of, of how a system um, behaves and is, is that you have some key principles that you can use as you're navigating through these, these various phases. And uh, like one example is that people are necessary. We have to invest in people. And I'm talking from the perspective of if like we're trying to support like local community work to happen, that, um, that investing in people, like actually paying them for their time Valuing their time and paying them for it is uh is, is something that we've seen. Like the, the let's just say that the 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 practice is like pay people, but like the the principle is like value people, and and that might look different ways in different contexts. For us, like I mentioned about the demographics of our town, like we have to pay people if we if we want to um, not be in this extractive relationship because. People have to decide whether or not they're going to go help out at the garden or going to go drive to Phoenix to go Uber drive because they need to pay their bills. And that's someone who has a job, you know, so like, we just have to keep those realities in mind. Uh, and then another one, be helpful. Like you can apply that when you're in your chaotic situation where you're doing your just do it action. If you just hold in mind, okay, how can I be helpful here? Well, then that's going to help you navigate through these, uh, these various um, systems you might find yourself in. Another one that we uh, focus on is why we care. For most of us, it's about uh, um, future generations and it's our, our young people. And um, it's, not, it's not, not always just this, right? There's a lot of other aspects, but like if you want to pull on my heartstrings, you know, all you got to do is get me to start talking about uh, our youth and, and why they matter and how amazing they are. Uh, but yeah, focus on, on why we care. Um, it, it helps to cultivate the will behind like doing all this work to begin with. Here's a good one that uh, I got from um, our good friend. And I say that uh, tongue in cheek. I've never uh, actually met Forrest Landry, but if you guys don't know who Forrest Landry is, if I had to plug one person um, today, it, it'll be Forrest Landry. Uh, but this idea of culture and connection before vision and strategy. This has helped me so much, and I wish I wish I would have known about this four years ago when I first set out on this work. Um, and then another aspect of, of culture and connection before vision and strategy is that the vision and strategy should be in service to the connectivity instead of like trying to use uh, our connection as like an instrument for making a strategy happen. It's like really the strategy should be an instrument to support the connections that we have with each other. And I have to remind myself of that all the time because I can kind of get into functional mode uh, more than I might like. And so, um, yeah, another, uh, people also say move, move at the speed of trust. And I think that's also applies in this the same idea of, of connection before vision and strategy. And the vision and strategy can emerge from the connectivity. Some practices that we're doing more specifically, if you're familiar with sociocracy, we're big fans. And um, so we use rounds, we use consent-based decision-making, we use proposal forming processes. Um, so these are all um, things that, that we are doing on a regular basis. And just a, a, a quick note from the field uh, that what we, when we got real excited about sociocracy, we're like, all right, we're gonna have like six circles that are all gonna have their domain. What happened is we dispersed the energy out. We just like too quickly broke up into these fragments. 
And so just like a, a, a tale of caution, if uh, anyone is interested in using sociocracy, um, if unless you already do, you probably figured this out too, is that like dispersing the energy, I wouldn't advise it personally. We have a gratitude practice that we do. I was I was of the mind to to nudge uh, Anna and say, "Hey Anna, can we just do some gratitude before we get started?" I know it's your I know it's you're the one hosting. So I don't want to be too overbearing here, uh, but we do uh, do a gratitude practice in in most uh, openings of of our calls, and it's just a good way for and and, and just face to face meetings too. It's a good way for us to bring our whole selves into into the room. And here's one that uh, I learned from Beto Cervantes. Sin dinero no baila el chongo, which means uh, without money, the monkey don't dance. And uh, this just goes back to what I was saying before around valuing people's time um, and their efforts. So um, big believers in this within our local context. And then this uh, is a framework that uh, I got from Regenesis and also Carol Sanford, if you're familiar with those schools. Um, it's this idea of how we think uh, affects what we think about, which affects what we do, which ultimately shapes the effects we have in the world. So power is upstream then. If we can change how we think, then we can have a lot more leverage in the work that we're doing. So I'm going to share with you a few mental models that we use that have been helpful for us, and I'll use some examples in them too. So one is this multi-capital framework. We all are familiar that monoculture doesn't work, uh, monocropping doesn't work, um, I, I'll put it to you that mono capital doesn't work either, that we really need a diverse form of capital and this story of money on money returns being the only way to see a return on investment is, is old news. And I think it's only a matter of time before we make a more effective transitions to that. For now, here's a multi-capital framework that we use. So here we have the community garden. We're going to say that this is our cultural capital that we're building when we're working on a project together. Um, so this is a, a tangible example of us. So the community garden is that we got a grant, uh, for about $12,000. Um, and it was earmarked specifically for us to, uh, get materials and infrastructure for growing. Great. So that's built capital. Here's Mary Martha building a garden. And then, uh, we build these raised beds called Lear gardens that we're using. They generate soil. They're great for growing in harsh conditions like ours. It produces both soil and uh, food. So here's some of our harvest there, natural capital. Um, here's some of our uh, friends, young people who are getting their hands dirty, learning how their like how food grows, where it comes from, and um, eating more healthy food. So this is supporting human capital. We throw those uh, planting parties, like I mentioned. So uh, social capital is, is cultivated there. And then uh, this is uh, Ana Maria Chavez. She's the CEO of Arizona Community Foundation, which is like the big foundation in our area. Here she is visiting the garden and uh, and that supports our political capital when we have something that um, other organizations wanna see and uh, and that, that helps us in a number of ways. So there's just an example of like how you can see the abstract um, concept of each one of these forms of capital and an example of how they're used in, in one particular project. This is a, just a, a small adaptation in terms of just how I've oriented things from the CCF framework, the Community Capitals framework. Everyone likes some good design thinking. I'm only bringing it up to say that uh, this has been helpful when we're all having ideas about how we approach something. If we say we have a bunch of ideas, we've talked with people, that's the em empathize. Uh, we've thought up and, and de defined what it is that we're actually trying to do. Um, well, like, if someone has an idea, especially young people, when they're getting involved, they have this really big elaborate plan and, and it would take obviously like a lot of time and resources to do it. We say, well, why don't you just start by just like drawing it up and just talking to people about it, prototype. Um, and then, okay, that went well. Okay, well, what's like a really small, safe to fail thing we can just try as, as, as our test. And then if that works, keep building on it from there. Um, and that's just been helpful to, to not uh, zap the, the fun and the will from people uh, with ideas when we go, oh, well, that won't work. That's you can just say instead, well, let's just do some smaller steps, this crawl, walk, run approach. Um, good old Eisenhower matrix. I bring this up because when we're talking about cooperation, a lot of people have different ideas about what we should be doing right now and why. So we can just explicate this a little bit more by just going on a whiteboard and showing our level of, of urgency, our level of importance. And then we all just together do an exercise of let's just let's write all the stuff down that we said we got to do. And let's just place it all, and let's just all agree where it goes. And if there's any ones that are stuck, highlight those and we'll come back to it. 
And that just makes for uh, us to get a lot more clarity as a group around what we're doing. Um, we use a bunch of other stuff. I, I was with another group before who uses Enneagrams of process. So I was explaining how we use the process Enneagram um, as a way to track our lunar cycles and then uh, time what we're trying to get done uh, using the the lunar cycles as a, almost like a like a way to track our progress with where we're at for something. So um, that's just like a natural way that we can work together. And then here, um, Miracle and Anna are um, some folks who have been really deep into this notion of regenerating the Colorado River Basin. Uh, how does that apply to what's happening in Superior? Well. Um, there's multiple scales at which we're working, right? So the town of Superior is nested in the lower Colorado uh, River Basin, um, which is part of the whole known as the Colorado River Basin. So um, there's work that's being done there, but it can it can fractal down into our watershed and the work that we're doing with our town and the Bureau of Reclamation um, into the region, which we'll talk about more in a moment, um, which for us is the Copper Corridor which is a connection of communities that we're working with. And let me just go to that now, because you're going to see um, a familiar face in a second here. So um, beyond just what's happening in our town, I mentioned how we're trying to um, see how we can be a benefit beyond our borders, you know, starting from beyond the borders of our own town. And one thing that we've been doing is, is convening community organizers and mixing uh, these doers with the donors. So we get foundation leaders who have open minds and are interested in what we're up to and um, have some faith that uh, we're doing good work and we bring them together and we start to find out how we can start to mobilize funding, um, connections, contacts to bring in more resources to support our region. And so right now we're working with uh, in total four different communities with uh, community organizers in each. And uh, here you can see some of the faces. Uh, here's Anna Prepara who is uh, using this, this really odd uh, process called pro-social. It's like this, she's asking us questions like, um, like, like how we want our group to be working in five years if everything's going well. And she asks us questions like, uh, what are our fears about how it could go wrong? Um, it's been really, really fulfilling to, um, to, to have, like, have a friend in the work, Anna, to trust that you have a good sense of, of where it needs to go and that it's backed up by all the rigor that comes from the work from this community. So it's been helpful when we're doing something new, which is you can see all the various towns that uh, we aspire to work with here that are part of our region. And um, it's it's new territory for us to do these kinds of regional collaboratives. And um, I've seen a lot of, of regional collaboratives that just really don't go well. I mean, you can look at the bones of these old websites that are just like unattended, you know, um, for years because it just didn't, just didn't go. So uh, we're being careful with that. We're mixing this top down, bottom up approach again, where the top down approach um, is like the questions around pro-social. I'll show you some other things in a moment. The bottoms up is like, what's a project that we can all work on that benefits us right now? That way we still have energy and that we're moving forward in some productive ways without only staying in the conceptual realm but we need the wisdom that comes from that conceptual realm too. So here's some frameworks that we can use in the process, like that nested questions that I mentioned before. If any of you are familiar with the vital conditions for health, this isn't something that we're explicitly using right now. It's just, I think that it's gonna be super helpful for us in the future to use uh, a framework similar to this to contextualize the work that we're doing, which is really holistic. Of course, of course the pro-social uh, facilitation and then when it comes to the systems analysis part of the pro-social um, process that Anna's walking us through, um, we are also going to be doing some uh, co-model building of, of a causal loop diagram as a way to start to understand the, the systemic interventions that we could take. And, uh, and then this is just an example of, of some of the key services that any community needs with this idea that uh, we can do an analysis of which of these um, services are being done by outsiders that we could bring it inside to relocalize our economy more. We have a bunch of partners that we work with and uh, we couldn't do our work with without the support we have from so many people and so many organizations. And uh, we're always looking for support um, financially to keep these efforts going. I will say that I just heard uh, that Arizona Community Foundation um, has found a, a donor that is from our town of Superior, and they said, hey, 
we'll match up to $25,000 for any donations that come in so we can help them help them us start a fund at the foundation and uh, and get what we need to uh, to fuel next year. So if you're feeling generous, I'll put a link in the chat. You can find our website and um, I appreciate you all taking the time to hear my words and I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm curious to know uh, reactions and questions. All right, Susan. Yeah. Thanks for the clapping. I gotta say, great, great overview, Chris. I was um very happy to hear of all. It's just so amazing how much how much you guys are getting done um in in uh regenerating Sonora with all your collaborations. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and while everybody's thinking about their questions um, and how we can move forward with the discussion, I was wondering uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that side story that you had teased us with earlier. It was like right between when you were um, talking about uh, how you left your job and you were leaving with a lot of questions about how to move forward with addressing the poly crisis, but right before your son was born. Mm, yeah. I mean, that was like uh, quitting my job and then asking the why, why, why question, like, well, what causes this? And then like understanding that there's like, there's more than one classification of what a cause even is. And then you have to think when, about systemic um, context at hand that like there's conditions, which is distinct from, from causes. So understanding how the conditions work with the causes, th that like led me over to some interesting domains of thought. Uh, spending time with indigenous uh, elders and uh, those wisdom streams as ways to start to understand the issue, um, seeing how colonization plays such a huge role in all of this and and like domestication um, has a lot to do with uh, like why we are where we're at. Uh, the enclosure acts, I think, was one of these major watershed moments that really changed how like Western civilization was relating to land and to each other. Um, and then, of course, the Industrial Revolution, on and on and on. So what I started to see is that, like, so much happens in the household, and this, like, notion of a, of a nuclear family is a real new concept, this, in this, this thought that you can have your, your, your whole complete uh, uh, support system all within the, the roof of one house is, like, that's a very new uh, concept. And um, so what, what are we going to do to support that, uh, that community? Community uh, effort to help each other out because that seems like it's kind of gone astray over time. You know, we've as as that colonization has happened, we've progressively delocalized so much of our world that to relocalize it became um, so so much of the work that uh, that I think we're we're now doing. And part of it is being like a, a living laboratory where we're trying out various methods, models, tools, um, theory informed practice. So uh, we're we're kind of shooting from the hip and then we're kind of also like, like doing a bunch of big brainy whiteboardy blah 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 like you saw so it's like it's having those having those things meet in a meaningful way we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to share more more of what we learn like the fact that I'm here able to share with you what we're doing here it feels feels really good for me it's fulfilling because our hope is that we can share what we're learning and uh, and that it'll be tested in our context for other people to find out how they might use some of these methods and practices and and maps in in their own context. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Well, Beatrice Briggs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I've been fascinated by your description and 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 applaud you for all the work that was done. And it reminded me, I did a lot of bi-regional organizing work in the 90s in Chicago, where I lived at the time. And we had, first of all, we had a motto of the, the group that was gathered around this idea about, if it's not fun, we don't do it. And mm. it was, didn't mean, you know, just party fun, you know, like that, but just it, so we never had a membership list. We didn't charge any dues. We just did, you know, and we, one of the strategies we used was field trips within our own watershed, you know, within our own region. 
and we'd find somebody local who lived there who received it was and 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 we'd go and discuss i mean we one time we went to see the the biggest waterfall in chicago now you do you know anything about the great lakes region it, it's about three feet high i mean it's not big but that was and uh i mean we just had lot, we had such a good time going around in a group and just people shared the rides with others and they sort of built that clan aspect and and then we learned a lot and we met other people who had these fascinating inter interests and things so that was one thing is is field trips, you know, to discover your own bioregion so that you can understand what in the world are we talking about with a bioregion, which is not a you know usual idea. And that was one thing. And another thing that we we met every four, four times a year in a sort of larger group, there where we were, it was sort of like the, I don't know, fall, winter, spring, summer, you know, yeah. something like that. Uh, and with some kind of... Uh, it was a kind of ceremonial thing, but not like heavy, weird, you know, but uh, like one time we, I found a list of all the endangered species in our region that came out of there. And we did it as sort of a litany. We went around and passed it around. Everybody, you know, people read from this list and we had some way of acknowledging each one of those. I mean, they were just simple things that we mm -hmm. figured I invented to do to make us change our relationship to where where we were another and um so oh and the, uh, just the, uh, here's one more of the guy things that we did that was very helpful at least that we'd say how do you know it's spring here i mean there are four seasons but how do you know what are the signs here in this area you know we get things the prairie people would talk about this pra prairie plants and other people would talk about what happened in like michigan and, and but Oh, and the other, and the last one I'll mention is we also looked around because I was desperate to find somebody who was writing poetry, you know, like the um, Gary Snyder of 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 our region, and we found them. You know, I mean, whatever whatever answers to all these things once you looked. So I really encourage. I'm delighted to see what you're doing, and I think it look. I love the model, and I can see why it works. So mm. way to go! <laughs> hey, thank thank you. And you know what, uh, Beatrice, you're doing is you're just like adding this extra nudge into this aspiration for us to do a field trip to the headwaters of the Queen Creek. Uh, which Absolutely. Is like, and, and then down to where it used to connect into the Gila. It's like, I've never seen this with my own two eyes. And like some of us are interested in doing that. So that well, was like- do it. Go nice, for it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thanks for the juice. And then also yeah. um, I wanted to, to mention, Anna and I, like we haven't talked about this, but uh, I was thinking with all the information that we've harvested from those questions that you've asked around like group dynamics, we have so many artists in in the groups. It'd be interesting to just like be like, hey, like, can you do something artistic with this information? Like, you know. So absolutely, I thought of that and then when you, you, and then you have an art exhibit and you show it off all together. And I mean, there's just so many things that are creative and positive and help bring people together around their, you know, where they live. The uh, the one last thing is that in oops. Uh, that I've recently had a renewed appreciation for is the idea of belonging, people having a sense of belonging to the group in this case, you know, that it's because they were random. There are people who didn't even know each other before, but they were brought together by these ideas and these activities. So now, and I don't know, I'm a group facilitator by profession, and in a lot of things that have to do with participatory processes, there's a big emphasis for the, in the last couple of years about about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, fine. But somebody pointed out early on, and I think it's just brilliant. Okay, you can do all those, that's good. But what you really need is belonging. A people to say, yeah, I belong here. I belong in this group. And um, then it made me realize that, that made, it's thinking about that now. There's these events took place 20 years ago, but uh, that there was a specific moment that was so important we had one of our quarterly get-togethers, and there were going to be a, a, a number of new people that were going to be coming. And so I asked one of the guys who had suggested the very first field trip we took. He was an older guy, retired engineer, you know, this kind of stuff. And he was always participating. But when they had this, we had this event, I asked if he would be the part of the welcomers to greet the new people. And it was, I found it, later found out because that's when he felt he belonged. He had been 
with us for a long time, but when he could take on a role within the group to welcome the new, that's what, that's what flipped him into the, gee, I belong here. So there's so much good stuff that I can see you've already got going there. And, and uh, I imagine, I mean, I could certainly see why it's working. So keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I've got the miracle here with us and you know you can hear, hear it from me and you know I'm, I'm happy to talk about it but i think for uh some questions you might have might be good to uh to pose some to miracle too as uh as a, a a key key participant and miracle worker in uh the work that we're doing here so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely yeah thanks for that beatrice no you're welcome susan thank you I love your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm curious, I, and I, I liked kind of the chaos and complexity. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that was beautiful. I'm curious about those um, Monday night movie nights or whatever night you mm -hmm. chose. How did they go from showing movies to actually creating community? You know, what was what was it about those gatherings? And, how did you structure them that it evolved that way? Miracle. So um, I like when we first got started and I got uh, my feet into regenerating Sonora. Um, it was like at the very beginning when Leo's was starting to open up again. So even for me, that was like my first like experience and my my first like um community events where I really was like a part of of Leo's and it, movies um I think were movie nights was just like we want communities to know about us we want them to know that we're here and that we're doing things and so that was just a good starter for people to get their foot in the door and know that we're doing all these fun things and that they have opportunities to do more fun things if they just participate um, and then it started to slowly move into like other things like community potlucks or like holiday events um, or like themed movie nights where people would dress up in costumes and come and, and bring food to share. And then once we got that that sense of community within a smaller group, they started to bring in their friends. They started to have ideas that they wanted to see at the community um, development center. And then we started to have classes and clubs and slowly as like people came to to Leo's to watch movies, they started to come for other things as well. And then it started to form a, a much bigger participation in other um, areas of the community center. Thank you. And how long did that take? I mean, from when you, you know, it's opening up again and you start to show these movies and then it's now it's potlucks and I mean was that six months a year and six months so I I uh started working with regenerating Sonora I believe like um August September of last year and that's that's around the time we started doing the movie nights and then um because of our facility and uh the temperature outside it was like kind of barren for a little while as far as participation because um it, it wasn't exactly comfortable so then we had to start thinking about like how are we going to get people out of their house and out of their comfort zone to come out to somewhere else to to be in participation with our events um and so I think it's that that idea started to shift a little bit of like you know doing the themed movie nights having food available um, you know, having blankets for people to just like be all cuddly during a movie or something. Um, and so I would say that like movie nights didn't really take off. I'm going to say like three to four months or like a couple of months in until yeah. like people actually started to come. Um, and then I would say that by the time it started to get a little bit nicer in the building, then we started to get a lot of participation. And um, so I would say like to really grab a lot of people's attention, maybe it, it, it was around six months to really like start to form these bonds that turned into clubs and classes. Okay. 
And and then I did want to ask about the clubs and classes like Tech Club. Tell me about Tech Club. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's that's a huge topic. Um, so there's there's a lot of excitement going on right now. I think I want to start with the most exciting things actually. Um, so well, let let me tell you the history. So it started <laughs> off with like one one kid coming. He brought his friends. There was three kids. Now there's I think. seven seven kids a part of the tech club um and that's not including me and chris in the tech club um and they started to just like form into like really cool stuff and and um their biggest idea that they came up with they had this invention called the wearable computer and it's a computer that you can wear on a sleeve a piece of clothing and it's supposed to help um disabled um communities with like living in a much easier way is is the main idea um I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it that really I don't even know their whole idea because that's really all of the kids that that are they like this idea they want to make it happen and then Chris and I and Regenerating Sonora are the ones that are like backing them up, giving them their push, giving them the financial need of buying the supplies to make it happen. So we're really trying to make their dreams come true because they're passionate about this invention that they want to create. Um, and then uh, with the collaboration of Art145, um, that's an art company that we were able to uh, transfer funds to uh, with a grant that we got from Regenerating Sonora. And so we, we do a lot of collaborations with, with Art145, and they're going to be having a fashion show, which is actually where, sorry, my, my phone, did I, get, did I cut out or anything? You're, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, so right now I'm actually at 145 uh, creating some designs um, for the fashion show. And that's what the tech club plans to do is they plan to make a prototype of their wearable computer and then put it on the runway during this Art 145 fashion show event. So um, there's also opportunities. We're going we plan to make a um, magazine of all the looks. So they're actually going to have their own page in a magazine where they are going to be able to like explain in more detail like what exactly the wearable arm is. Um, so now they're gonna start getting like uh, media attention for what they're doing. Um, they already do um, in other areas. For example, um, we are starting to talk with a company in Arizona. I mean, in, well, yeah, in Arizona, but specifically in Superior called AZ Strat. Um, and they want to turn uh, the technology club room. They just took on this room within uh, the community center and they want to turn it into a techie lab where they can refurbish computers for the community or refurbish like really anything once we start to get that credentials. Um, and AZ Tech is um, very passionate in helping the youth in the tech club get their certification so that they could have the credentials to have uh, the ability to refurbish and go into a tech job, which a lot of the uh, students and youth in the tech club want to do for a living. So it's going to start to um, give them that that step forward in their own career. And these are just high school students, um, but we're starting to give them that that push where we're, we are helping fund their dreams and their ideas. And we're also helping them in their education and their careers. Um, so there, there's like so much stuff. And I mean, they're um, some of the biggest supporters of regenerating Sonora and the community center in general. Um, they're very like on the ground. They help us with so many events. They plan their own events. They actually hosted their own prom this year or te technically last year, I believe, uh, for the school year. But um, yeah, they, they do their homecoming dances coming up that they're going to do at the community center. So they're starting to do, um, oh, and they do the free the free clothing rack. So we have like a clothing rack at the community center and we get donations of clothes and then we give it out to the public for free for whoever needs it. And they're the main ones of that operation that collect the clothing, they organize it, they put it on the rack, they put it outside. 
Um, and that that's also going to be available at the um, at the fashion show for people to just have free clothes and get that that knowledge that that's even available for our community. Um, so they're they're doing a lot of stuff, um, really good stuff too. Thank you, thank you for all of that information. I'm going to let other people ask questions, and then I'll come back. Oh, Miracle, I'm glad you didn't talk about Fight Club because Tech Club is also Fight Club, but we don't talk about <laughs> that, so good job. Yeah, the number one rule is to not talk about Fight Club. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Brad, I, I'm not sure if you're able to, to talk. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity, oh, and he is coming in someplace else. So I think he's coming in on another screen, maybe. Maybe not. Um, well, because I, I have uh, one one questions too, but it looks like Brad is joining. So I'll give him the opportunity to, to ask his question. Hi, Brad. Brad. Oh, we couldn't hear you. Go ahead, Anna. Maybe he's getting situated. Yeah. Um. So I I know that this is a story that you told me about um how you identified some of the hey Brad how you identified some of the the key goals that you wanted to to um identify that weren't actually really all that um all that apparent to you when you first uh probably when you had your your board member retreat what it, it was that regenerate Sonora really wanted to to dive into. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of share some information about how you really helped define what your purpose was and come up with all of these really strategic ways of uh, addressing those that purpose. Yeah, I mean, here's there's a couple of ways that that we've been doing all this stuff, but I think the most tangible way to talk about is I'm going to pull up so I can actually show you is this causal diagram that we built. So. We had some help from our friends, uh, Mark Pearson and Carrie Turner. And uh, we had this big whiteboard where we were just looking at uh, the town of Superior. Uh -huh, okay. The, the town of Superior as a system. And um, we started to write down all the variables associated with um, the, the health of our of our place. And then we started to see what affects what, what reduces. It's like like the, back to the moon. It's like what's waxing and what's waning. So um, higher prices means a, a waning household purchasing power as an example here. So all the dotted lines are the waning and all the solid lines are the waxing. And so you know, we started to map this all out. It's kind of an eye chart to look at, but uh, it's, it's really interesting when you just kind of follow some of these along. But we start to find that there's some reinforcing loops that occur that uh, if we're trying to make some significant changes, if we can leverage exponential uh, effects, then we're going to be able to be all that more powerful. And you could just see here as like a, as a for instance, that uh, household purchasing power uh, increases local spending. Uh, local spending means more viable local businesses, which means more local employment, which supports household income, which gives you more household purchasing power as an example, right? So when we saw this and you can look at these variables and see how much feedback each variable sits on to know uh, which ones are, um, are are highly networked with other effects. But what we found here is this whole reinforcing loop tells us, gosh, we weren't really thinking that we were going to focus too much on entrepreneurship and, and, and local business growth. But like, if we want to help um, financial stability and household purchasing power, which we saw just ends up having all these other relationships. And like, you kind of know, like, you know, hungry people, um, they don't always want to stay hungry. They're going to do whatever they need to do in order to feed them and their families as a, for instance, and just not having the resources and support that one needs to have a, a, a quality life has drastic effects for the town. So uh, household purchasing power then is like one of these uh, nodal points because this also showed us why land use and housing became so important because affordable housing like everywhere is such an issue. So if we want to um, help with financial stability and, and household purchasing power, then it essentially was necessitating that we need to do something 
on entrepreneurship, like relocalizing our economy and uh, and since doing wise decisions around land use and housing. So yeah, not not things we really set out to do originally, but it's like, well, necessity is a goddess around here. So you got to do what she says. Ooh, got a thumbs up from Brad. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to hear what, what I went through, but if you have any questions or responses, then uh, we're all ears, my friend. Yeah, thanks. No, I sent I sent my otter pilot in 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 my stead because I think I missed the first part of the presentation. So um I'll try to try to catch up on that. Nice. Um but yeah, no, like your like I like I like that uh the the great what do you call that diagram? Oh causal it? causal loop diagram. Causal loop diagram, yeah. Thanks. C L D. Yeah, well, Beatrice, you, um, you got anything else you want to add? Um, and then we can um, kick it back. Yeah. To, yeah, I do. I've been, it's been great to think again about some of the organizing things we did as a group in, in Chicago. And one of the things was that uh, we, well, we sort of convened a meeting of bioregionalists that we knew from other parts of the country. And, and one of the things we did was offered field trips. So our the people that had been working with us and exploring with us and everything, they were given the task of find a place that is not on the, you know, standard tourist bus trip kind of thing. Find a place that means is meaningful to you that you would like to show people from another part of other bioregions and things to know. And it, it was, it was. A, outrageous success <laughs> for both for the people who went on those trips and the ones who organized them because it gave them a whole, other, a whole new relationship to be to to be introducing the some of the aspects of and they were everything one of them was to visit was around the subject of homelessness homelessness in the city which some of the people who came from other parts of the country that were not so urbanized and everything they were fascinated and they were, I mean everyone was different and we also had some work days. That day, one part of it where was there were all these different work activities, uh, and that ranged from scrubbing a, a big, I don't know, wasn't some big fa famous statue down in the middle of the downtown Chicago, and we got the fire department to loan us a, a fire truck and with a big ladder so they could get up there and get the grit yeah. off the place. Yeah. And uh, so just a lot of creativity that came out of that. But the trick was just get people to say, you propose things you would like to, you would be personally willing to do that can be done, you know, within a matter of two or three hours or something like that. And and we'll create the context for it. And it was great. So that's uh, the local field trips organized by the people of your, of your group that you can then invite a bigger public to is a fun thing nice mm -hmm. i like fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> are, are you done beatrice i don't want to cut yes, it i am fin you know finished yes thank you sorry uh, and i really liked you know if it's not fun we're aft I, I love that and i'm curious I mean, if you were to ask either the youth that have been involved or the others that like, what are some of the most fun things you have done that have like gone off, like through the roof? Right. Fun that people have just said, oh my goodness, we need to do this again. Or I can't wait until we do this next year. Mm, good question. I mean, no, a lot of things. I'm sorry, I'm asking, I'm asking Chris. Great. Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's kick it to Miracle. Yeah, um, for my own ex experience, um, if if we're talking specifically about like regenerating Sonora's participation in events, um, I would say the the eco conference we had during the Prickly Pear Festival. Um, I think that'll probably end up being a reoccurring thing, and that was just kind of like on the fly. We uh, we had a little bit of preparation for that, but it was ultimately like a new experience for 
all of us to to do that basically what it was the eco conference um so we have this big annual prickly pear festival every year in superior at the chamber of commerce um we put together the eco conference where we uh gather people of different expertise and panels to talk about land use water use um permaculture green living all kinds of topics and uh, regenerating sonora was able to participate in a panel um, and it originally was actually supposed to be a much bigger conversation like we plan to have a panel with regenerating sonora the town council the mine um and and a couple of other um like you know arizona water company and it was supposed to be a really big conversation of like what are we doing here what's our plan and how can we regenerate um but a lot of people ended up backing up backing out of that conversation but if we continue to just do eco conference after eco conference it's going to be hard to ignore um that and that, that was very um, powerful to be a part of that. Um, I think another one would be our disco parties that we have. Like we, we really only have had like one real disco party where we had like the laser lights, the fog machine. Um, that, that was a really fun event. And like we had, you know, the VIP tables, we had wristbands and stamps and um it, it, that was a really good time we had like a dj one of our youth tech clubs was our dj for the disco and um that yeah that was just a really fun event and it kind of turned into like other parties like them doing their proms and wanting to do their homecoming um and then eventually hopefully start to do more disco parties for fundraisers to you know help fund them and their projects um and and the community center I would say another event that was really fun that I would love to see again is our um, our Thanksgiving potluck. Um, we like, you know, just invited the community. Everyone brought something that they could they could share. And, and it turned into this like huge community Thanksgiving, like get together. And, and we watched like the Snoopy Thanksgiving movie for the kids. And um, that that was uh, un it. You know, we send out all of these invites and we don't exactly know who's going to show up. Like we say like RSVP, but superiors like we'll we'll show up if we want to and you and we won't tell you about it. Um, unless you like are pounding them for are you coming or not? Um, so it was actually a really big feast and a really good um turnout for that. I would say another pretty cool event that happens is like our um regenerating party so we had one in march and it was this huge block party on pinal so that's where um, our community center is at on pinal avenue and we had like the road blocked off and there was people from all over arizona as far as like uh, phoenix to kearney and like um, so many different kinds of nonprofits and lots of organizations, foundations. They came here. We made the front news of we made the front page of the newspaper, um, and you know that we we had it catered. We had like a a list, a set list of like all of these things that were going to be happening, and we really got to celebrate uh, for the first time with a lot of our supporters, like regenerating Sonora and and regenerating, and um, that that was a very powerful event that happened for us and uh it was a fundraiser so that we could buy our building and I think like we we made a lot of money on that fundraiser um it I would say like it what more than forty thousand dollars was made almost yeah yeah Right. So that that would be nice to see to see that event reoccurring like every year having a regenerating party. Um, so I, I'm excited to see uh, it. I feel like it'll have the same feeling when we have regenerator regenerating Sonora's fourth fourth birthday this Saturday. I feel like it's going to have that same feeling of like we're, we're celebrating what we've been doing and it's a good update and um, a good time to get our supporters together. I'll I'll, uh, I'll throw two other ones in there uh, before uh, Anna, if that's okay, because um, I'll, I'll like they'll, I'll probably lose it in my mind to to reference them later. But uh, just talking about like what what happened yesterday and what we have planned for next Friday is like super exciting in my opinion. So um, like early in the morning, um, we had 
uh, our friends Benedo and Francisco from Mexicali as they were leaving from uh, the Colorado River Basin uh, Landscape Leaders Retreat that Anna and Miracle were at. They came and stopped in and we got to hang out with them in, uh, in Superior, show them around, have a good time. And they bought some soupy soil from us, which we were really excited about because this is like we're trying to to get our soil out there into into other people's gardens, right? And then so that was a, a nice time. Later on that day, uh, we had uh, people from a, a a farm in a neighboring town. They came and they bought uh, fifteen gallons of soupy soil from us, and we got to talk to them and find out that they live in Globe, Anna. So we got some more people that we can bring into the into the collaborative that we're doing. We had had a great time there, and then. Um, I had to say bye to them because we were talking with U of A's environmental department about the event that we're having next week. And like uh, uh, John, one of our tech club members just was, was so excited to find he's talking to a professor at U of A. He was like, oh, this is so cool. So that was fun that he was excited. And part of what we were planning is on Friday. So next week is the full moon and we are uh, doing a full moon planting party. But uh, the whole lineup for the day, I think, is really exciting. Because from one to three is U of A comes and does a science uh, activity with our youth. We're doing an arsenic testing of, of water samples. And so we'll do that from one to three. And then we're all going, including our U of A friends and some other uh, other partners. We're going to be in the homecoming parade. So we're going to all be, all be part of a float. We'll do the homecoming parade. After the homecoming parade, we'll go to the garden. We'll do the planting party. And then we'll pack up from the planting party, put everything into our vehicles and drive to the football field uh, for a tailgate to watch the homecoming game. So it's like, I'm really pumped. And it's just so, it's it's hilarious how much goes into planning some of this stuff. Like, um, and then tomorrow we're having our regen parties. So we've got our, yeah, totally. We've got our like invite list and like, what do we need to prepare and do and like all the logistics, but it's just, it, it's fun. You know, we're, we're having a nice time doing it. And many hands make light work, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Anna. Yeah, so I'm wondering, Regenerate Sonora has only been around for four years and obviously there's a big difference between all towns pre and post pandemic, but you, you guys seem to have such amazing attendance at your events for such a small town. I'm wondering if you can speak to like how Regenerate Sonora has really changed or had an impact on the culture within Superior. Is it, is it, it cause it sounds like it must be tangible and like noticeable. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you know, there, and there's direct ways and indirect ways, right? Like some of the indirect ways are like with our regranting programs that we do like we received a thirty thousand dollar grant and two thirds of it went to local organizations for them to do their work. So like just them being able to put on their events and do the programs that they need to do, it's like you don't you don't see that it's regenerated store that's doing that, but just knowing that like we're helping other organizations be able to fulfill, fulfill their missions and provide um, exciting and engaging and morale boosting events for the town is important. And then there's like small things like. Um, our town and maybe this is other towns too, is like notorious for like places never being open. It's like you, uh, you want to go eat over at the restaurant and they just happen to be closed that day. And then you want to go to the restaurant the next week and they happen to be closed that. So just us being consistent about our offerings. Like we say like, Hey, first, uh, Wednesday of every month is open mic night. And it is, you know, the doors are open from, uh, four to eight on Thursday and the doors are open from one to five on Friday. And then we have these kinds of events on these other days. And it's like just understanding that there's like things happening on a consistent basis that people care enough to continue to sustain these ongoing efforts that like speaks volumes. Um, and um, it, it like, in a way, it kind of sets the tone for like, hey, we, we could do this. Like, and sometimes we kind of accept like, oh, that's just the soupy way, you know, oh, yeah, you know. But it's like we can demonstrate other ways of 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 working that um, that are a little bit more functional that are all in support of just like us having a nice time together, um, and so much of that question is like you just feel it. You know, it's hard for me to like point to because there's like the functional aspects and there's more of like the the states of mind and like the morale boosting aspects that you just feel and see. Like bring like we helped to bring um, three three TVs, Good Morning Arizona, to Superior uh, three weeks three weeks ago and so that means like we were all on on statewide television 
Uh, all the different businesses got to, a lot of the businesses got to get highlighted and other groups got highlighted. So like that just like injects a big, uh, a big, like, I don't know, it's just nice to know that other people outside of our own little town care about our little town, you know? One of the things that I suggest, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, that you keep your eyes out to just to keep to capture the history of this, because this is history making work you're doing. But what we found that was after it didn't take too much before some of the much more mainline, great, you know, normal groups like the Friends of the Chicago River or the Lake Association, they started doing some of the things that we were doing. Mm. You know, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. You know, I mean, fine. <laughs> we need. You know, and they started having different kinds of exhibits and field trips and all kinds of things that were in their sphere of, of, um, of experience and interest. So that's as you to see. You know, see change happens is not only from you know people who were before were disconnected or disinterested or you're not you know like the young people and stuff to these established organizations art in museums or or whatever who who can uh, who then start doing imitation is the sincerest term of uh, uh, form of flattery they say and seeing who's following picking up outside of your own group but they they copy what you're doing because it's they see that it, it's it's good yeah that's that's a really good point and i think what what we're, where we're at with the way in which we've been doing things is like a seems like it'd be so hard to copy because it just like it just took so much time of just like nurturing 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 to build this kind of foundation that we have um you know what we find like there's the the infrastructure of like getting a building but then that social structure of like who's going to show up to you is it just an empty building or are people showing up it's like that's that's difficult so i just i would uh, guess that some of these groups who tried to or who did the same thing depending on what kind of ways they were relating with the with their community to begin with, if they weren't already building that kind of social cohesion, then they 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 may have fell flat because it's it's almost not about the the event, right? It's like mm -hmm. the, the event is the, the visible thing. The the invisible is that intersubjective element. Absolutely, yeah. Good. I'm gonna get my charger. I'm still here. I'm just uh gonna do this. <laughs> And you can look at my cool diagram. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I'm re really happy about the conversation that we're having because uh, I can tell that uh, just from your perspective, it's like you have experience with this kind of work. And um, yeah, I'm I'm appreciating your insights. Great. Yeah. Well, I guess I would comment or say, you know, um, I'm on the other side, like not not having experience in community organizing um, and not being sure where to start, uh, but wanting to, uh, you know, make sure that I am not making common mistakes. And uh, yeah, so it's, I'll look back through the notes a little bit and um, yeah, appreciate the pro-social trainings that Anna's put on and that way of thinking, um, because just, you know, well, let me just name a couple of couple of small things and like the pitfalls that I'm seeing, uh, you know, for me personally, um, in my HOA, which has 291 members, um, you know, there's been some, you know, upheaval from like, you know, uh, us, removing the manager and then um, you know getting a new manager and stuff and people like come together at this like kind of crisis time and then there's there you can feel like the community building in that but then people get kind of exhausted uh, with the tension and kind of drop off and I'm thinking you know how do we keep having meetings or events that are uh, feeding people so that people aren't getting burned out. Um, and then the second thing is like right now, what I'm seeing in the town in Grand Junction, um, the city manager closed uh, Whitman Park, which is where the homeless people stay, you know, saying, oh, it's for 
um, uh, to maintain the park just for events, you know, but it's obviously pushing the homeless out of downtown out of the, you know, the, the mainstream. So the, there's a, there's a small backlash against that. And, but even in that backlash, I see like one of the voices is just really negative. Like, let's go out and protest. Oh, these guys are doing this crazy thing, you know, and, and it's that like getting, getting mad and using that for change, you know, and what the duration of that effort is versus like built really building community, which I think is what Chris is doing. Um, so I don't know if you want to, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I guess the question, Chris, is, you know, what, what are the like nascent or what, what are, what are the, um, what's the, what's the essence of what you're doing that can be replicated? Um, and especially working with, as you bring in different actors in the community, how do you deal with those kind of loud, obnoxious voices or the voices that want to take it off in their direction for their project? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, so um, in the original, like the early parts of the talk, I mentioned like when you're working through chaos, you just kind of just have to just do it. And and I would say that uh, in, in what I'm hearing, what you're talking about, like you might just need to do some just do it actions and you can hold some things in mind, like, well, if we can, if it can be fun and helpful at the same time, then awesome. If it can only be one of those, then that's, you know, probably okay too, but I'd go more towards the fun. So like, can you, um, like I was just even picturing like the, the people who are like, yeah, we're going to go and, and, and protest or what have you it might be really hard depending on how, what the situation is to try to like get people to not do that or something but mm -hmm. the fact that they that they have the will and that they're engaged is is good and you might say like hey i'm not going to make it to the protest if you if you're not into that but after the protest and we all meet at this one location when it's over like based on the route how about we just go out and get some drinks over at the place across the street or something and you mm -hmm. might be able to you might be able to be the one to kind of peel off some of what's happening there because essentially you're just working with that energy that's like has the will to go out and do the marching and say okay cool cool well, then after you do that then let's kind of shift shift things around and go have some pizza and beer together or something you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah but i, I yeah. think the the common mistake might be like thinking that there's a perfect way to do it and not doing anything because you're trying to find the perfect way to do it and it's just like you know just find some ways to to have some fun with people and that structure of the H like the structure is going to have something to do about the quality of connectivity that you're having, right? If the structure is the, the, the HOA meeting that happens at this time or whatever, I would try to just get out of that structure and, you know, try to have some ways, maybe some people that uh, you think are like-minded or uh, are not ultra busy and like are, are like kind people to just like, maybe just go have like some, some breakfast talks or some lunches, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. to just, just, and, and just, just let them, let that inform what that next right thing to do is. That'd be my recommendation. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a, both a, that I'd like those suggestions and the underlying issue as dealing with, with people's pro sense of property and ownership and stuff can bring out the worst in people anyway, as far mm -hmm. as I can see as a facilitator and everything. So I think I agree that with what Chris was saying about, okay, shift the focus and think, okay, we're going to have a session, you know, something or other, depends what works in, to uh, explore, learn and explore a little bit about what was here before us. Something like that, you know, what was on this land before this, so these houses were built. What is the, where's the what is the watershed that's here, you know where does our water come from because mostly people say the faucet you know so that's not quite good enough. you know before that you know and just get think get interesting questions that people that these same very people who were so can be so argumentative and hostile about certain things when you get something like we're talking about right here well did you ever know did you know that da, 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 da? or here this this part here this is where the you know the watershed starts or ends or whatever, to, but just make it a more, uh, switch the focus of what they're talking about, you know, and they're so that they'll be more curious than argumentative. But Beatrice, but Beatrice, not everyone is going to be interested in that. 
Of course not. But so what? You just find the people that are right. And I think that you, have, you like, find the people you who just, are. You, yeah. yeah. You don't, don't, don't try to be all things to all people in this case would be another recommendation, Brad. It's just like, just with what Beatrice is saying, know in your mind, like there's going to be the people, blah, 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 blah. well, okay, well, who's into this? And those are the ones that you go and have your, your coffee or lunch with. And then exactly. let that build some coherence and strength to be able to later on withstand when the one person tries to come and do something else with it. Yeah, I'm really, really feeling that energy and that uh, that clarity as you're as you're describing that. That's where I really I really get a benefit from from this group and you know um, what we're doing in the design school in that I think it's like nourishing all of us on this like deeper level so that we can you know enter these other realms that are more hostile and practice and uh, and then come back and. <laughs> and uh regroup and uh rethink yeah yeah and yeah and shout out to to joe brewer for um getting us connected between uh brad and anna and and also for him being the one to introduce the the pro social um like school of thought into the mix it's been helpful for me hmm. yeah wonderful oh um susan did you want to say something I was going to say, I, I do need to leave here in just a minute, but I just wanted to really thank you, Chris, and please pass my appreciation on to Miracle. Um, you both did a fabulous job and um, you nourished me in many ways with this presentation. So thank you. That's sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was, it was really nice to, to, to have your eyes on this and, and your ears too. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and since we are, we are at time, I thought that we could actually, I know that this is different, but I thought we could close with some gratitude. Um, <laughs> nice. so you, you essentially just name what you're grateful for. Um, like I'm very grateful for my family. I'm grateful for, um, the fact that I live in the great lakes and it's such a beautiful landscape in some parts. Um, I'm so thankful that I've been able to connect with pro social world and the design school and that we have members here from both groups, uh, to be able to hear about all of Chris and miracles, amazing work. So yeah, I'm grateful for, for all of the stuff that you guys are doing. So. Um, and I'll pass it on to, to Susan since you need to hop off. Well, I, if we were close, I'll stay till we close. Um, uh, so I have so many things to be grateful for, but so I'll keep it short. First of all, thank you, Chris. I love, there's great heart in what you're doing and I feel it and I see it in the work that you're doing. And I think that's why you're being so successful and I applaud all that you're doing and, and the success that you're having. Um, and and I love the sense of community that you're building because I think that's that's how we're gonna really regenerate literally everything. So applause, applause. Thank you so much. And I will pass Brad. Yeah, and I'm just feeling grateful for being able to show up at this time. I've had to um, you know, kind of drop out and cancel a lot of the the things that I was intending to go to. Um, so, you know, thankful for the, uh, the the internet and thankful for my friend who picked the kids up and took them to the library. So I had a little bit of a little bit of downtime. Um, yeah, and and thankful again to to um, Chris and Anna for this for this time to um, put this stuff out. And and I'll pass to uh, Beatrice. Thanks. I'm grateful for this whole movement that has brought, I feel like I, I found again my tribe. I was so up involved as you could probably pick up when I was living in Chicago. And then I wound up living in Mexico where I had to adapt in a whole lot of other ways and learn the language and, and have been involved with a, bio, a very a wonderful bioregional activities there. But uh, listening to you all and, and telling your stories and what's going on, it really well, to me, it's a big relief to just have been a, in, a, in a context where you don't have to explain what a bioregion is, <laughs> that there's some <laughs> level of understanding of that. So I'm just grateful to feel like I sort of felt like feel I'm in the process of moving back to the United States to be with my fam my family of origin. And and it just it just makes me so 
happy and enthusiastic uh, about that, not only to see my daughters and my grandchildren and all that, but also to know there's people out there doing this great work. So thank you. Hmm. And I'm singing this on my phone, so I don't see who else, the other number, the name. So somebody else help me out. Who's, yeah, who's left? Um, I am grateful for caring humans. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Chris. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good night. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.